Welcome. I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. Our whole world, locally, nationally, and globally, is facing three simultaneous crises. One is peak oil, the time when oil production has maxed out and is starting to decline. The second is climate disruption. Global climate chaos is being caused by burning fossil fuels that result in excessive amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the third simultaneous crisis is economic contraction. Resources are limited, and it is just not possible to have endless economic growth. Each crisis alone is massive, but all three together form what you might think of as a perfect storm that is more powerful than just the total of the three separate crises. Each of these requires a critical rethinking of how we live our lives as individuals and how we function as a society. Many people are in denial about one or two or all three of these crises. Some people assume that technology will save us or markets will save us or the Democratic Party will save us. But these three crises are real, and we will be even more vulnerable if we deny their existence, dismiss their seriousness, or practice wishful thinking about easy solutions, or returning to business as usual. This month's TV program focuses on positive solutions through a creative new approach that is spreading around the world. A growing worldwide movement for transition initiatives and transition towns is addressing these three crises head on using grassroots people power to generate creative and sustainable solutions. A new movement here in Thurston County is growing and working to pursue these solutions. And I'm happy to welcome three local citizens who are at the forefront of this effort. I'm happy to welcome Gita Moulton, Ramsey Zinnerman, and Joanne Lee. Welcome. Good to have you here. Thanks, Thanks Glenn. So let's start with one of these, uh, peak oil. And I wonder if, uh, Ramsey, you could summarize how the, what the peak oil crisis is. Sure. Peak oil refers to the uh, process by which uh, oil production uh, reaches its peak. Uh, it hits a maximum and then uh, declines after that. Uh, oil production generally uh, follows a bell curve. And uh, we have a, a graphic which shows uh, oil production that is uh, taking place in various countries in the world 
many of which many of the countries of the world have already peaked and are now coming down the, the back end of that curve. Uh, probably the, the last uh, place in the world that has not uh, completely peaked is the Middle East. And uh, a lot of information these days say that the peak in the Middle East is either happening now or will be happening very soon. Uh, the real implication of that is what happens when oil production uh, no longer can keep up with demand. Once you get to that level, um, the, uh, the demand is, is increasing globally. It's continuing to increase uh, with countries uh, like China and India uh, continuing to uh, become more industrialized. Meanwhile, the industrialized countries in America, we still use a, a very large amount of energy. Uh, there will be serious problems when the demand for oil uh, is greater than the supply for oil. And these will potentially include uh, scarcity and extremely high prices uh, okay. for fossil fuels. Great. Thanks for that background. We want to look at the climate uh, crisis next. Joanne, I wonder if you could summarize that. And we have a, a graph that you can explain for us. We do. Um, the graph is pretty dramatic because it covers 60,000 years of our history. And if you'll notice, we have about 40,000 years of a red line that's sort of bumping along within about 200 to 250 uh, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And then we see a blue curve that goes up pretty steeply, and that has to do with the most recent ice age. And then we have another red line that tapers off some, and that's um, our civilization past the Ice Age. And then we see a very dramatic, on the graph, because of the, the uh, axes, it looks like it goes straight up. And the first section is in green, and that's the Industrial Revolution. So the beginning, really, it, it uh, corresponds to the previous graph. So as we saw that steep increase in oil um, production, that's what we're seeing on this graph in terms of the back end of that, if you will, so uh, CO2 emissions. And then the last part of the graph is uh, in orange, this dramatic spike, which is the very recent increase. And this graph is 2006, so we're already at 2009, and we're already beyond um, the 200, or the, I'm sorry, the 380 parts per million shown here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's, it's escalating, and, yes. and uh, we need to do massive efforts to turn that around. Yes. Joanne, can you also tell us about the economic crises we're in? I mentioned economic mm -hmm. contraction, mm -hmm. but, but you, there's another factor in the economics that's not sustainable, and that's the concentration of wealth at the very top. We've all heard, you know, that the, that the uh, gap between the haves and the have-nots continues to increase. It's, it's very dramatic when we look at it. We call this the champagne glass, um, with not a little irony. Uh, what it's showing us at that top bar is that 20% of the world's population has 80% of the world's resources and, and wealth. And that leaves 80% of the world's population in that narrow funnel with 20% of the resources and wealth. And we can take this same champagne glass and we can transpose it into the United States and we see the same thing happening even within our own country. However, the reality is when we look at the worldwide or the global picture, all of us in the U.S. are in that upper 20 percent, just because of our, our, our standard of, of living here. And that has all kinds of implications, including the size of our military to protect that disparity. Yes. And the fact that it's just not sustainable, just like the climate problem and the oil problem are not sustainable. Right. The, and the, uh, uh, the economic, the contraction of our, our economy is uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, because of limited resources, we just cannot have endless growth and endless economic expansion. On the day when we taped this program uh, in mid-July, uh, the uh, local newspaper reported that our county's retail sales dropped again for the fifth mm -hmm. consecutive quarter compared to the year before in terms of retail sales from that quarter of the previous year. So uh, with it, we're in an economic recession or depression, but this is really a, a symptom of what, what happens uh, because this economic trend that we've been on for so many decades is, is really not sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, we might think of it as a correction. I don't yeah. think that's a popular notion, but right. maybe more realistic. Uh, Ramsey, um, the, there's a transition initiative movement that all three of you are involved in. I wonder if you could 
uh, tell us just something about how your how the transition initiative movement is dealing with the combination of these three uh, threats. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the transition initiative movement is is looking at these uh, in combination, and is really uh, calling upon people within their communities to uh, to gather together, try to tap collective wisdom. Um, and asking the question, how can our community thrive in uh, a new reality that would include an, an altered climate and uh, much less petroleum um, and potentially smaller economies? Uh, and when the uh, community gets together and, and kind of takes hold of its own uh, destiny, if you will, um, there is a lot of uh, good ideas that come forth. People can. Uh, be proactive and positive and, and try to deal with uh, not just the fear that comes from having a world that is uh, potentially unrecognizable, but instead uh, trying to uh, form their, their own future together as a community. Um, there's um, transitiontowns.org that relates to the movement, and I've looked at that website a bit, and there's a lot of stuff there. What, what would we find for anybody? What would we find at transitiontowns.org? The, uh, the website is set up as, as a wiki, which means that um, many people from different uh, transition groups across the world have been contributing to the website. So there's a lot of their collective experience and wisdom uh, going into the website. Um, there's a lot of background information about um, how the, the process can work and uh, how communities can become transitional communities, transition towns, and uh, just sort of uh, a gathering place for, for wisdom, I think. Joanne, you described this as uh, uh, the transition initiatives movement as a process that produces a product. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Really what the transition initiative does in a community is that it acts as a process to catalyze what's already happening there. So it's not about coming in with a new organization or something new to do. It's about knitting or stitching together what's already there existing, the good work that's happening. And we have a tremendous amount of that, that here in Thurston County. So the process that has been developed is a 12-step process, mm -hmm. which um, is only slightly ironic because I think we're dealing with an addiction to oil. We're, we're dealing with addiction to a, a consumerist uh, lifestyle, which uh, doesn't serve us. It doesn't serve the human race. So in the process, we go through, um, either sequentially or not, it's not a rigid process, we go through certain steps to reach an end product. And the end product is called an energy descent action plan, or EDAP is the, the acronym for it. But essentially, you know, what, what Ramsey was talking about, a community that brings its best ideas forward and then decides how is it that we're going to live with um, vastly reduced oil resources or dramatically different climactic conditions. I think we're experiencing some of that already in our communities. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it's disruptive to gardeners. It's disruptive for all kinds of things. So it's a process and a product that a community can take its future in its own hands and create something, uh, a future without oil or with less oil that's preferable to the life that we have now with oil. Yeah, so it doesn't mean that, that we live crappy lives as a result. No. We might find better quality by, by having less oil and doing things in, in better ways. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, and there's a handbook that you can just show the folks that, so there's a lot of, a lot of content there that help people through the process. This is the guidebook. It's a it's a fabulous um, overview of the whole process. And on the websites, I'm not sure if it's transitiontowns.org or um, transition. There's like three or four different sites if you Google transition. Um, but there is a primer that's available for free that's about a 50 or 60 page, sort of a condensed version of the handbook that's okay. available if folks are interested in taking a okay. look at that. Um, and the... Um, uh, on the energy solutions, let's, let's talk about what some of those energy solutions might be. Uh, can you tell us some more about these uh, energy descent action plans or how you approach the energy issues? Anybody? 
Well, the, the energy descent action plans are, are the newest sort of cusp of this movement. And so there are several communities in the United Kingdom, at least, that have created energy descent action plans. Uh, we have not here, and when we do here, it will be a collective effort. It's, uh, the phrase that's used a lot in this movement is unleashing the collective genius of the mm -hmm. community. And I just love that because if, if we can go back to thinking about that initial um, graph that Ramsey talked about, it took a tremendous amount of ingenuity and, and uh, creativity to build that steep um, mountain uh, you know, of, of our industrial culture and the, the products that we created, the machinery that we created, all of that. And it's going to take equally as much uh, genius and ingenuity to come down the other mm -hmm. side. What's that going to look like? I mean, I have some ideas, but I don't really know. I don't have a crystal ball. Mm -hmm. And it's really going to be, I think, up to our community. I think some of the elements of it are already here. You know, Gita and I are, are avid gardeners. Actually, I don't know if Ramsey is, but um, you know, I go to Gita's place and look at her garden, and I think not only is that going to continue, but hopefully we're going to see that all over our community. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk a, a little bit about energy alternatives, and then we'll get into the food production, because I know Gita has a lot of creative ideas on that. What kind of uh, renewable energy resources are, are you looking at? Yeah. Well, well first, when we talk about energy, um, there's a couple different ways you can divide things up. Um, certainly, uh, transportation is one huge use of energy. And then uh, sort of the, the next one that we can look at is uh, energy that's used within a building. Uh, within a building, typically, it's for heating and cooling and electricity. So looking first at transportation, uh, petroleum is uh, the vast majority, almost exclusively, uh, the fuel used for transportation. And the alternatives for that would include things like biofuels um, or electric-powered vehicles. Um, but the sense of scale that we have with transportation right now, the renewables that are available and that are coming in the foreseeable future, it's very difficult to see how they could possibly um, maintain the level of transportation that we do um, across the world. When you look at the energy use that's uh, used in buildings, um, we can, there's a, a larger variety of fuel sources that are currently used uh, for electricity off the grid and for with natural gas and other fuels for heating. But there are many more opportunities to use uh, passive technologies, so things like daylight and uh, heat from the sun to heat your building, uh, or geothermal systems to do heating and cooling. Um, these are all systems that uh, use nature as a fuel, and you can have them on site. Uh, furthermore, when you look at the electricity that's being uh, used in, in a building, uh, that can either come from uh, power generated on site or comes from the electrical grid. And these days there are uh, very viable large-scale technologies for using renewable energy to get onto the electricity grid. Uh, things like wind power in the Great Plains and windy areas and things like concentrated solar power in the deserts. And now the, the real trick is being able to take that electricity uh, and delivering it to where the electricity is needed. And in order to do that, we need to vastly improve the, um, the electrical grid that we have. Um, so there's a, a big movement to, uh, to get the grid ready to do that. So there, there are viable options uh, for electricity in buildings and uh, lots of passive systems to use uh, in buildings for heating and cooling. Um, but with uh, transportation, it's difficult to see how we can maintain the level of transportation and shipping that we have now. Mm -hmm. Gita, um, what potential do you see for food production locally? I mean, certainly the food that we eat, people say, comes on the average like 1,500 miles from the farm to our right, kitchens. Right. And so one way to reduce that transportation problem is to grow food locally. And there are other well, benefits of... Yeah. local food. Tell us about that. That's one way to reduce it and also when, when we the oil supplies run short we're going to have to grow food locally because it won't be coming from from yeah. Florida oranges probably. Or, or, or from Chile. Or from Chile. Jeez. I don't know. What do we do without <laughs> bananas? And, <laughs> um, I think what, I think well what the, the growing of food I mean industrial agriculture uses oil for, for growing the food for fertilizers. It uses it for processing the food, for packaging it, as well as shipping it. 
-hmm. so, if, so if the oil supplies are either exorbitant or non-existent, we're stuck with having to provide food where we live here. And, and this is a real challenge. It's a real challenge. But people are doing it. You're, people you're are doing, doing it. it. People are doing it. But when you look at the population, people, enough people aren't doing enough of it, and, there are too, and more people coming. Uh, we have, um, I think, 68,000 farms in the county right now, and 60% of them are within a mile or two of the urban growth boundary, so they're at great risk of development. And a lot of those farms are not, are, they're growing turf, they're growing other things beside, beside food, and, and we only have, I think, about 12,000 acres protected in long-term agriculture. So, so what we really need to do is to support and protect the farms that are here, try, try to protect more, more land and have, convert more land into farming, even, even having spaces uh, great where um, young first-time farmers can rent land because a lot of young people want to go farming, but they can't afford to buy five acres in the county. Yeah. So they need a place to grow food. Uh, when, when we were preparing for the program, you mentioned that besides the well-known garden that Michelle Obama has planted at the White House, that there's a food garden at Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace has a garden. The Queen is, and, and, the, and the Prince, of course, is very enthused about doing this. And even the City of London has, um, is talking about giant food bags that you can grow food in. I mean, they're anticipating this is going to be a, a real problem, providing food, even in the, the cities. And, and uh, talking about using old burial grounds and places where they can throw these giant bags to grow food. Uh, very creative idea. I think um, the Vancouver, city of Vancouver, the city hall has a, has a garden right there on the grounds. The United States Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. has a garden now on the grounds. Uh -huh. um, and, but the most interesting, we've talked about this yes. garden in Pasadena, and maybe some of your viewers know about it, but there's a family, uh, a father and three grown children, who have um, a garden in downtown Pasadena, it's kind of wedged between a couple of freeways, and they grow 60,000 pounds of produce on a tenth of an acre every year. And, and it's, it's just amazing. And you can, go, you can Google it. You can Google Pasadena homegrown and find out. There's a, there's a film that's making the rounds of film festivals on this homegrown uh, family. Um, but you can get a trailer on Google that's really interesting to watch. It's just amazing what can be done in yeah. a small space. You, you told me that Bellingham, the city of Bellingham, Washington, has a food security Bellingham, policy. Bellingham, Whatcom County is working on food security. Uh, Portland, oh. Portland uh, completed a study of uh, all the available spaces in the city where you can grow food. They completed it two years ago. I mean, they're way ahead of us. Yeah. I think they had some interns from, from Oregon State yeah. helping them with that. So we could certainly uh, have interns from the Evergreen from State Evergreen, College or we could. You know, students... Because yeah. they have the organic yeah. farm, and there are people there who care there about. There are a lot of people interested in it. Yeah, and but, we we need to do it. Yeah. Um, what, what you have a, a a garden in the alley? Well, my neighbors and I got together. We have we have a we have a little group called Chicken Run because we have, there's a movie called uh -huh. Chicken Run. And we all have chickens, but but we, so we have. Um, this summer we started doing a, a more garden. I've had a garden there for a while, but we have built raised beds in the alley and, and the chickens run up and down and the food grows and we share food. And uh, It's building community as well as growing food and it's, it's really nice. We, and I have a garden I have a garden of my own at, at my son's house also, a big garden where I grow all of our food. Well, that sense but, of building community is, seems like it's part of, right. when I've heard you folks and other folks in your transition movement talking, a lot of the solutions end up Building community they by do. sharing things, oh. and uh, including the the uh, neighborhood garden, and that's right in a in a regular West Side. Oh, it's close right. We have the little tiny lots. We're, yeah. we're practically yeah. so downtown. It's, do it's doable. Yeah, and of course there there are at least four community gardens that I know of in Olympia. There are probably more, and there's this wonderful mm -hmm. new one that T.J. Johnson has organized, mm -hmm. pulled together, on the east side called the Wendell Berry Community Garden. Mm. Uh, which has a great big, long, 80-foot hoop house for growing things in the winter. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of land. And I understand that Lacey's looking at a community garden space for the, their first community garden. Uh, okay. So community gardens are, are cropping up, and we need a lot more of them. Well, and then I want to mention uh, some local uh, organizations that support yeah. this sort of thing. One of them is uh, Sustainable South Sounds uh, Urban Agriculture program yeah. and they have uh, uh, it's at www.sustains 
southsound.org. Uh, Terra Commons has been around for a while, mm -hmm. and they install what they call edible forest gardens, mm -hmm. and people can learn by doing there, and they are at www.oly-wa.us slash terra slash efg. Um, but Terra Commons, you ask around and people right, can connect you can with just, them. Yeah. There, yeah. People, yeah, you can Google that or something. And then there's um, South of the Sound Community Farmland Trust that promotes and protects farms in the South Puget Sound area. This is a really important group to support. They, they just have come out with a wonderful report on the state of farming in Thurston County, and you can, you can Google it, find, uh, find out all about it. Um, but then they're trying, raising money to buy a uh, mobile poultry processor for farmers to use so they can keep the poultry within our county and do the processing. Um, it's raising money, but they, they really need support in this community because they're the ones that are trying to keep farmers on the land and protect and buy more farmland and working farms, keep them going. Yeah. All of these things that we're talking about are, are of course interconnected mm -hmm. as are all of the ecosystems and all the social and economic and political realities and everything else. Um, what kind of economic alternatives would you look at to address the kinds of problems we're talking about? And this could be kind of wide ranging. Well, I think one of the key features of the transition movement around the world is relocalization. So it's really about finding the resources within our own community or developing or redeveloping the resources within our own communities. So it's about uh, local businesses and buying local. We have a wonderful buy local program through Sustainable South Sound. And I think people know that it's a feel-good thing, but we don't often think about, or maybe, maybe we do, the importance of it and what it means in terms of the local economy. We have had uh, local currency in this area, and we have another regional currency that can operate locally that's starting to get a foothold here again. It's called Fourth Corner Exchange. And so all of those pieces build resilience, mm -hmm. build a community that can withstand shocks from the outside. So a, you know, a trucking strike where we can't get um, Imperial Valley uh, produce mm -hmm. or um, you know, whatever, whatever that, whether it's a, maybe a climate uh, shock to the community. If we have this strong local economy that's not dependent on resources and transportation from other parts of the country or the world, then we're we're um, we're just in a lot better shape. Yeah, the, the the globalization that people seem to think is a good idea mm -hmm. makes us vulnerable to all kinds mm -hmm. of other mm -hmm. problems elsewhere in the world. And the more we can be sustainable and uh, autonomous, it doesn't mean that we can't have connections or mm -hmm. relationships across the world, but, mm -hmm. but in terms of meeting our vital needs, the more we can do that closer to home, the, the safer we are, the more resilient, mm -hmm. to use the term that you had. Mm -hmm. um, and, su and supporting, and supporting uh, local farmers as well as local businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, shopping at the farmer's market, uh, asking the supermarkets to label where they have mm -hmm. purchased locally grown mm -hmm. food so people know mm -hmm. whether they, they can support. Yeah local farms. Yeah, the Olympia Food Co-op tends to do that. They, the they like to support yeah, Occasionally you'll see it at Bayview, but not often. And, and we could do much more with a farm to school program where schools are buying locally yeah. grown food for the mm -hmm. cafeterias. Yeah, schools and hospitals and other mm -hmm. major and food suppliers. And that supports suppliers. the economy of the farmer. Yeah. Um, there's um, uh, grassroots leadership as part of this that you talked about, Joanne. Um, in the transition initiative movement, you mentioned this a bit earlier, um, and you said that you can't expect governments to drive this from the top down, that it's mm -hmm. got to be bottom up. Tell us some more of that. Well, uh, I have a lot of respect uh, for what our governments do. I mean, they have a tremendous charge, and particularly um, our current, our newest administration and, and the challenges that we're facing. And I think it's, um, you know, I don't, uh, it's a false sense of security to think that we, as the citizenry of this country or, or of the world, can sit back and expect the politicians or our elected officials to solve our problems. I think that, um, first of all, there are more of us. You know, we have, <laughs> collectively, we have more resources. Um, we have more collective genius. Um, and we're impatient. 
So what I find is that I'm meeting people all the time that want to do something. And it's not that we can't work with the government, we can. Um, but unfortunately, because of the nature of bureaucracies, and this is not a criticism, but they tend to slow things down. I, actually, there's just an article in the paper yesterday or today, so mid-July, about Flint, Michigan. And Flint, Michigan has oh, yeah. this tremendous uh, urban agriculture program going where the, the vacant lots, the nasty you know, vacant lots that have been there for years or decades, are being turned into small urban farms. Mm. And it's, it's very inspiring. And they put up a hoop house. Gita was talking about this hoop house in eastern, um, uh, in the east uh, end of Olympia. So they have a hoop house that they want to put up in Flint, and it's uh, they've they've gotten it as a donation. It's going to enable them to grow vegetables all winter long. I mean, Michigan's a cold place, mm -hmm. and the city doesn't have zoning for it. It you know the city doesn't know how to handle it, so it ends up costing this grassroots organization twenty thousand dollars to get this hoop house, you know, put on this lot. So there's that level of frustration, I think, with people. And so we're, we're you know, we're going to do it. We're going to get things rolling, get the ball rolling. The, the coordination with our own local government, I think, is going to go well. For one thing, our um, comprehensive plan is up for its 10-year uh, decade review. So at the same time that the transition initiative is starting to encourage people and invite people to envision a preferred future, the city's doing the same thing. So what a perfect opportunity for us to you know, link arms. And um, we can help. We can help in that process and get people engaged. Yeah. Tell us how the transition towns idea emerged in Europe, if you can do that kind of briefly, and then we'll look at where it's been spreading across the US. Well, actually, it started in Kinsale in Ireland, and it was at a permaculture uh, training school and spread from there, so spread into the UK from there. And I don't think that's been mentioned yet today, but this uh, movement is rooted in permaculture, which is an older movement from the 70s. Bill Mollison and David Holmgren are two of the key figures, or were two of the key figures in that movement. Um, so it has spread through the UK, through uh, Ireland and, and Wales and, and Great Britain. Um, so that's, there's quite a concentration of towns there. And then from there, it has spread uh, through Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, uh, Japan, the United States, I mean, Canada, and, Chile. <laughs> and we have a map of the United States showing mm -hmm. where uh, some local initiatives mm -hmm. uh, are happening. and. Uh, so it, it really is spreading across this country as well as around around the world. That's really it is. cool. Um, what's happening in Olympia? Uh, I know you folks are around, and you've done a couple of, as of the date when we taped this program in mid July. You've already done a couple of major presentations around. What what else? What are, how's the movement going here in Olympia? What's happening? It's pretty new. It's pretty uh, new in Olympia. We haven't had much time in a mm -hmm. couple of months to get started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have lots of plans to get to get a real move on this fall, but um, we need uh, lots of energy and lots of help. Mm -hmm. It's been very encouraging yeah. so far. Yeah, uh, very good turnout for a couple of uh, initial programs and meetings and discussions and uh, a good visioning session that we had recently. Uh -huh. Seems to be a lot of initial interest. And you'll have a website up and running in early August yes. at transitionolympia.org. Yes. We're, I talked earlier about the 12-step process, and so we're really at step steps one and two. So step one is creating an initiator group or a steering group, and we're probably half of that, um, that little group. Mm -hmm. And then step two is raising awareness. So there are lots of people that know a lot about climate change, a lot about peak oil, a lot about our economic situation, but there are even more people that don't. And so part of our charge, if you will, is to find that, um, that audience and try to help people become more aware of what this perfect storm, this triple threat means for our, our future, our very immediate mm -hmm. future. Now, the, I know a number of people who've been to some of your presentations. I went to one. And everybody that I've talked to about your presentation has been very much impressed. Hmm. The first one you did and then the one you did in, in mid-July and 
hopefully by the time people watch this program in August, uh, you'll have more things going on. Mm -hmm. But that's that's encouraging. Mm -hmm. We've talked about Olympia, but it mm. the process really goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. If we want to, I mean, when you look at the U.S. map, mm -hmm. what what's the potential then beyond the city limits of Olympia? Well, well, the initial. No, go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say we, we obviously need to draw in the other communities mm -hmm. in, in the county. We can't be sustainable and do this all by ourselves. No. So, this is a nucleus. We're starting yeah. here and hope that it will spread quickly to the other to the other uh, jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, a proximity and sense of scale is very important uh, when you think about uh, high transportation costs, and so uh, different things would have. Uh, different proximities or different distances that they would draw from. So something like a hospital, for instance, would, you know, would not be sustainable for just a, a small neighborhood, wouldn't have its own hospital. It's going to still draw from an area. So even though uh, the transition initiatives are looking at relocalization and looking at sometimes very small units, there's, uh, they have to exist uh, in connection with other ones and they get to uh, larger units too that are connected in different ways. So. Yeah, I mean, some things work, can work at the neighborhood level. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, not everybody own, needs to own a lawnmower, or should, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe somebody could own a goat that could visit <laughs> multiple yards or something, who mm -hmm. knows what. Sure. Um, but some things do need that larger scale, like a hospital would not make sense at a neighborhood level, but some things would, like mm -hmm. the neighborhood goat mm -hmm. or something. Um, there are some uh, other aspects to the transition initiative movement that we haven't yet talked about, and those are more uh, humane aspects or even spiritual aspects. And a couple of you had mentioned on the phone as we were preparing for the program some of these. Um, and I wonder if, if, if uh, anyone could mention some of these that make sense to you that are compelling. Well, what, one of the several factors that were very compelling for me when I was introduced to this was the conversation about inner work as well as outer work. So I think as a culture, we tend to focus on the outer work. Let's do the work. And that's great. There's a lot of work to do. And I think that um, sometimes it's, th there's a tendency to ignore the inner work or you know, maybe leave it for later. So this, this initiative and the folks that founded this have really put an emphasis on doing the inner work. One of the ways they talk about it is that it's, it's about the head, the heart, and the hands. So it's the work with our hands. It's the thinking and the creativity and the imagining. But it also engages our hearts. And I think that's really critical. It engages our feelings. Um, I know for me personally, as I become more educated about these triple threats, I can, I can have a strong emotional reaction. I can get very sad, or I can feel overwhelmed, or I can feel depressed, and, and I think that's pretty common. Um, the danger is that people move into paralysis or denial, and then are not able to engage their head, heart, and hands. So being able to talk about that, and in the first presentation that I gave, I talked about those those pieces, and it seemed like it really resonated for people. People want to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Maybe not everybody, but I think mm -hmm. a lot of people do. And when we were on the phone preparing for the program, you mentioned that maybe something like Joanna Macy's mm -hmm. work on despair mm -hmm. and empowerment mm -hmm. regarding nuclear weapons is something that we need to do. Yes. Revive mm -hmm. that from mm -hmm. a few decades ago so people can deal with those feelings and then come out the other end and be uh, productive and useful exactly. and not just stuck in feeling overwhelmed. Yeah, and Gita found a new book recently. This oh, I, I oh, haven't. The, the, yeah, the sacred it's demise. A current, it's a current book called Sacred Demise yeah. by Carolyn Baker, and she's looking. I think she's looking at the relationship, the spiritual path through industrial civilizations collapse. Um, and I'm hoping that it's going to be helpful to me because I get I get pretty overwhelmed when mm -hmm. I think about where we're headed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a lot of people could yeah. could find this very interesting reading. Yeah. And you're so good at, at the book discussion groups. I know you've done a lot of book no, discussion it's... groups with the Northwest Earth Institute, yeah. mm -hmm. and you've got some book discussion groups coming up. That well, I'm I hoping I can help pull can pull together people who do want to, to get together and discuss, mm -hmm. read maybe the Transition Handbook or, yeah. or the, you know, the, A World Made by Hand is another wonderful mm -hmm. one to read. It's a uh -huh. novel that time, but. Um, uh -huh. um, when we were preparing for the program, Ramsey, you mentioned some aspects of technology and you had a kind of an interesting angle about 
uh, super high tech and super low tech. Share that with us. Yeah, well, it's it's not a matter of just going back to how things used to be. Um, we're not all going to be living in the dark in a cave, and you know, it's also not a matter of just um, going back to pre-industrial society uh, straight away. Um, but instead, it's about uh, using what we've learned and uh, with technology, but then applying that to uh, a situation where we have uh, just less petroleum energy to use, and you know the the world looks a bit different. So, uh, using technologies that really focus on making the most out of human power, so uh, very high efficient bicycles or pedal power, um, and technologies that uh, make good use of uh, natural sources of energy, things like solar and wind and the heat coming out of the earth. Uh, I think that those technologies are very important as well as just the fact that uh, we will still be <clears throat> able to communicate with one another. Um, the, you know, we have uh, instantaneous communication practically for free around the world uh, through the internet and through cell phones and everything else. Uh, if we can keep the energy up and keep those systems up and running, then uh, that's not going to go away. And so we'll be able to uh, share our knowledge and experience in a very high-tech way in ways that uh, pre-industrial civilization didn't do. But at the same time, we're going to have to use technologies that uh, don't rely on just an abundant um, source of petroleum. Instead, they're going to have to rely on um, muscle power and um, the power from the sun and uh, from the wind and from the earth. So I think that there's uh, just a, a tremendous design challenge and there's uh, a whole lot of work to do to uh, figure out which technologies uh, can, can best meet those needs. You know, what comes to mind for me is a wonderful little book from the 70s, which we could well bring back again by E.F. Schumacher called oh, yeah. Small is Beautiful, yes. oh, because he be talked fun. about appropriate technologies. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting to do as a yeah. book study group. I, I, I bought a copy back then. I haven't read it yet. Oh, it's good. <laughs> so I probably it's good. Need Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time. You had read time. That. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, the, the problems that, that we've been addressing, uh, especially at the beginning of the, of the program about uh, peak oil and the climate disruption and the economic uh, problems, those are interconnected and there, there's some synergy among them where they make each other worse, the perfect score, storm that somebody's mentioned. And as we think about the solutions, it seems that the solutions are also interconnected mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. that, that there are payoffs for all three of these. If we can do these kinds of alternatives and solutions that we're talking about, they help the climate, uh, they, they give us real alternatives to oil. Uh, better alternatives than, than going to war for it. And they also address the economic needs uh, and provide uh, smaller scale economics and a more equitable economic system. So the, the solutions also have some synergy to them. Mm -hmm. And, and they, we get more bang for the buck out of these kinds of things that you're talking about. So I really appreciate that, that approach. Um, all three of you are really at the forefront of this movement that is just taking off. and. Um, it seems as though this is the right time to do this yeah. for the reasons that we've been talking about. Uh, so wh why do you think it's the right time to get active or how can you, what, what are you finding as you talk with people about this? And I wonder if we could just dig a bit more into that. I think people are, people are wanting to be active. The people that are, that are aware of where we seem to be heading are looking for answers, they're looking for information, they're looking for action they can take, they want to do something. They, they, they're feeling really eager uh, to get involved in something. There's a good uh, climate too in terms of uh, what's going on at a national level. Um, there's uh, a lot of uh, Federal Recovery Act funds uh, that are coming from Washington. Uh, a large percentage of those are uh, dedicated to um, energy issues, and uh, communities across the nation actually um, have uh, funding coming in this year that are dedicated to energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, and many of the things that we've been talking about today are, are casting out 20 years, perhaps. Um, but this year now, there are opportunities to uh, begin that transition by 
uh, making some really good decisions about how we invest funds that are uh, coming from the national level uh, in programs that uh, effectively reduce energy and create jobs uh, and build our communities. And, uh, you know, we talked about uh, the, the extent to which government is a solution. Um, it's a critical part of that. And in order to make local governments effective, uh, we as people in those communities need to be uh, very aware of what's going on and, and supporting the programs and uh, making sure that uh, everyone makes good decisions about how to invest that. And, you know, we have uh, a few good years left mm -hmm. to, uh, to really make changes and, and be proactive about how we, we go in that direction. Yeah. And, and you'd already mentioned the Olympia, uh, City of Olympia comprehensive mm -hmm. plan as a perfect timing for mm -hmm. this. I, I also think I'm going to go out on a limb here, um, to use Shirley MacLaine's phrase, and say that I think that it is a time when there's a global shift in consciousness. And there have been a lot of people talking about this for a very long time. And you know, some of your viewers may be familiar with that. But I think it's bigger than just uh, political or economic or even uh, environmental. I think it's about the human species having an opportunity here to move from this notion of separation and independence and uh, you know the rugged individual to a sense of unity and what can we do together because we can't do it separately mm -hmm. anymore it's yeah. you know we have created a world that shows us that very clearly yes. there's a little bit, little bit of that uh, hundredth monkey phenomenon mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. all of a sudden mm -hmm. you know just a lot of people are getting it all yes. at once yes. and so that makes it the, the right time to get organized as you folks are doing mm -hmm. and as other people are doing on this mm -hmm. transition uh, movement. Um, where could a person get more information? I know there are a lot of sources, a lot of ways to get connected and to get information. Can we share some of those? Well, I Google everything. That's my, you know, <laughs> I, do, I, do I, I know there are some weaknesses in that approach, but there are some great, great websites. There's um, transitionwashington dot, uh, transitionwashingtonstate.ning.com. There's a whole kind of a community of Ning sites for, for the transition initiatives. Um, our new website, which is going to be growing and, and building. There are great books. There's the Transition Handbook, which we talked about. There's a, a new book by Sean Chamberlain called The Transition Timeline. There are excellent, excellent permaculture books for those people who still read. Um, mm -hmm. David Holmgren is, uh, is one of the key figures, and, and I recommend his books highly. And then Gaia's Garden, which is by Toby Hemingway, and is he's a local uh, Cascadia region, he's in Portland. And so his, his permaculture approach and his, his gardening approach works really well for our communities. You know what I love to do? I love to, I go to Transition Boulder or Transition Colorado and find out where there are other communities that are doing this and are ahead of us and have been doing it for a while and get all kinds of ideas that they've already figured out what yeah. to do in a community yeah. that we can learn from. Well, the city of Portland and, and has done a lot of innovative Portland has things. Done a lot. They've done a lot mm -hmm. in Portland for making it walkable and bikeable mm -hmm. and, and oh, the, the oh, local this, food production. This exciting, and, yeah. uh, creative work with homeless people, all kinds of stuff. The, the Montpelier, Vermont, for instance, is mm. supposed to be our uh, uh, capital challenge city with Olympia. We're oh, supposed yeah. to be... Well, they are light years ahead of us, I yeah, must say. Yeah, but, Olympians but, should not be smug. <laughs> no, we, they we, should we not be. We've done stuff here, but we can't be smug. Cause but it's a fun lot to see what Montpelier is doing. They're, they're way out there. Well, yeah. and we'll encourage people to look at your new website when it comes up Great. Um, as well. And, and there's also www.transitiontowns.org www.transitiontowns that just has all kinds of stuff. We talked yeah. about that yeah. earlier, mm -hmm. how it's set up as a wiki where people are contributing a lot. Um, there, there's a, some of the people watching this program in August will be watching it before the August 10 showing mm. of a wonderful mm -hmm. film uh. about how Cuba survived mm -hmm. what's essentially their peak oil crisis mm -hmm. because they were so dependent on the Soviet Union for oil. Yes. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, then all of a sudden Cuba had no oil and they had to mm -hmm. radically rethink how they function. And they mm -hmm. did all kinds of creative stuff, local food production yeah, without food. oil pesticides and oil fertilizers. and. Uh, carpooling and walking and biking and more mass transit and all kinds of creative solutions. Gardening your front yard and your mm -hmm. rooftop and yeah, all kinds of things. All over. And there's, Very and there's inspiring. A, there was a current um, a little uh, eight-minute thing on YouTube uh, update mm -hmm. on what how Cuba how Havana is oh, today because oh. the film is a couple years old but yeah. um, you know, it was really mm -hmm. fun to see. Yeah. It's so just this, turned green this, the city. 
This will be Gardens. shown Monday, August 10 at 7 o'clock p.m. at the Mix 96 meeting room yeah. at the corner of State and Washington, just kitty corner from, from the, the trip. inner city yes, transit. So that's something to check out. And for those people who are watching this program after that August 10 showing, uh, check around. I think the, library, look, I think the library has a copy. Well, you can also, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's also it's on, it's, uh, uh, it's on YouTube. So YouTube oh, is yes. another yeah, fabulous resource. Okay. It's got yeah. the whole okay. uh, power of community the, yeah. and yeah. update. That's the name of it, is the power of community, mm -hmm. how Cuba survived. And, and we will have time for discussion afterwards. Yeah, And also, local folks, the, your local effort is using your phone number as a contact mm -hmm. point, 352-6224 uh, uh, for the local effort. Um, how would you like to get people to get involved and participate? What multiple ways? might we uh, encourage? That's a challenge. That's a challenge. We, you know, we've had several small programs um, with filming and, and other topics. We had a good one on backyard farming. Um, we had too many people show up according to the Mix 96. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> such a good turnout. Yeah, exceeded we over exceeded the, the, the capacity. Mix, yeah. Um, so we're trying to do programs around the community on various topics and until we get sort of reach a critical mass where we can have a hopefully have a, a major uh, a speaker and, and do it large scale to introduce it to the community but gradually making connections and coalition building around the community uh, as we go okay um, you, you've got uh, let me just mention some of the uh, again some of the books that you may be doing book study mm -hmm. sessions on uh, Rob Hopkins' book, The Transition Handbook, uh, From Oil Dependence to Local Resilience. James Kunstler's World Made by Hand, a novel of the post-oil future. Richard Heinberg's Power Down, Options and Actions for Post-Carbon World. I've read that. That's good. And people can contact you at 352-9351 uh, or... Right. I can just facilitate... Connecting people, people connected. and then that's they can have great. their discussion. Um, the, there's the Cool Thurston campaign that's been working mm -hmm. on climate, and they deserve yeah, great, great. credit. They invite people to go on a low-carbon diet, and they've done some really, really good creative work uh, to reduce our carbon footprint, the amount of carbon dioxide that we generate. They're, they're working work. with the county commissioners right now. They're oh, taking they the course, good. yes. Okay, so the Just Cool wonderful. Thurston campaign uh, would be at wwwoly hyphen wa.ning.com. Terra Commons, we mentioned earlier, they work on what they call edible forest gardens. So mm -hmm. it's a mix. It's not just uh, flowers, but it's like stuff that you can actually be eating mm -hmm. and you can learn by doing, and they're active. Uh, you can ask around and get to Terra Commons. Um, and these other organizations, we mentioned Sustainable South Sound Urban Agriculture Program, uh, south of the Sound Community Farmland Trust that we mm -hmm. talked about, um, and so forth. There's just a lot going mm -hmm. on. It's just exciting. I wonder, could we share a brief closing word from each of the three of you in any sequence that you want? <laughs> uh, well, I just think it's really important that we uh, focus on being uh, proactive and looking at hopeful solutions. Uh, we mentioned earlier that uh, all of these uh, different things that are happening all together, they uh, are very overwhelming. Um, any one of them is overwhelming. When you look at them all in combination, uh, they're, they're certainly strong. But uh, I think that the, the, the appeal of the transition initiative is that uh, we can begin to look at solutions and uh, try to be uh, proactive about uh, creating our, our own destiny, perhaps. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think I think it's a great opportunity to, to build community and, and work towards something hopeful. For so many years, I've been involved with the environmental movement, and it's just been negative, negative. You know, this is although the the threats are fr are frightening. I mean, there's some pretty heavy stuff coming, but the possibility of changing changing where we're headed is is very exciting. It's very positive. I think that's the real appeal of this movement. And for me, I, I think about a Frederick Buchner quote. He talks about location being the place where our deep love, my deep love meets the world's deep need. And I see the transition movement as that place where each of our deep love and deep longing meets the world's deep need. The world needs everything, and each one of us has something to contribute. Mm -hmm. So I'm just um, hopeful that everyone will jump on board and, and we'll do this together. 
Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Well, I want to thank all of our guests. I want to thank Gita Moulton and Ramsey Zimmerman and Joanne Lee. I want to thank all the folks who've been watching. On the, the day that we taped this program, the local newspaper reported that our county's retail sales dropped again for the fifth straight quarter mm -hmm. compared to the retail sales from that quarter in the previous year. We know that the economy is moving from recession into depression, and we don't know how long this will, will last, but global resources are limited, so the pursuit of endless economic growth is just not sustainable, and we really have to rethink fresh ways of doing our economy and fresh ways of interacting with the natural world around us. The global and the national economies will never return to endless growth. We have to adjust to a new world of limited resources and economic contraction. We can either plan to adjust in ways that will strengthen our local communities and build a sense of human and natural connectedness, or we can fail to plan and get beaten down in ways that hurt all of us and hurt our community. That, that choice is ours. We've been discussing the growing movement for transition towns and transition initiatives around the world. This movement offers a creative, humane, and sustainable way for our local community to create a better future. And I encourage you to connect with this exciting new opportunity and to connect with your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, the people uh, at your place of worship. Connect with anybody you can. Bring out your best values and your creativity and do it together because together we can do it. For information about the organizations that we've mentioned here or information about a variety of other organizations and activities and issues that relate to peace, social justice, nonviolence, and economic and social well-being, you can contact the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at area code 360-491-9093. You can visit our website, www.olyfor.org. We're all one human family. We all share one planet. We can make the world a better place, but we all have to do our part. And the world needs exactly what you have to offer. Thanks. <laughs>